Toronto, Canada. Where, am I, where are my Canadian peeps at? Make some noise. Okay, so you guys are going to back me up here, okay? Canadians are notorious for apologizing. So much so that they will apologize to you every time if you bump into them. In fact, in 2009, Canada passed the Apology Act. And it was a legal recourse designed for lawyers to defend Canadians, wait for it, who would apologize for a crime that they didn't commit. The words, I'm sorry, can be an unconscious response, it can be a showcase of empathy, or it can be two of the most healing words in the human language. We spend our entire lives alternating between being the offender and the offended. We're delicate, fragile beings. So today I want to share with you some ideas on how to offer a heroic apology and what we might be doing that undermine our, our apologies and keep connection from occurring. So about a month ago, I went to visit my doctor and it was just a regular visit just to check my blood work and whatnot. And so as I'm standing in the office, I see, okay, you know, normally I'm expecting a 20 minute wait, but 20 minutes turned into 30, turned into 45. And then my frustration started to move towards a little bit of annoyance, maybe a little bit of anger. By the time it hit an hour, I could feel almost resent coming in. By an hour and 15 minutes, I, had finally be put in, I was finally put into one of the medical rooms, and I was waiting for the doctor to come. But every few seconds, I would stick my head out like a meerkat, looking around, hoping to meet a nurse's eye so they could see the look on my face and know that I wasn't happy. Then, about an hour and 35 minutes, my doctor comes rushing in. She rushes in, and she sits down in her chair, and she doesn't look me in the eyes, I really wanted her to. And she crossed her legs, and her legs are jiggling. And then she asked, okay, so what happened? How would the test go? And then as soon as I started to speak, I could feel, that my, doc I could feel my doctor's impatience. And I could see her leg jiggling, and, and then as I spoke, her hands started to do this. And then all of a sudden, I could feel like a, a, like a rage come up in me. And then I looked at her and I said, stop. You need to stop and pull yourself together. Take a breath. Your energy has come in here and it's stressing me out. It's stressing you out. It's stressing the whole space. And then she stopped and she turned to me and she said, you're right. Thank you. No one has ever had the courage to tell me this before. I've taken on too much, and sometimes I don't know how to regulate myself and calm myself down. So then we held hands, and then we breathed together. <laughs> and then the whole situation changed after that. And as I walked out of that doctor's office, I said to myself, look how many people that wouldn't speak up today. Look how many people I saved from that frazzled medical professional trying to navigate their medical issues. I was quite proud of myself. This is a simple way that apologies can heal. But what happens when it gets more complex? What happens when you add parental wounding and power dynamics, throw in a little bit of your ego, all the meanings and stories that you're constantly making, your ability to keep yourself calm, your ability to take perspectives, and then it becomes a bit more complex. That determines how quickly your defenses go up and down, whether you apologize or you hold on to resent, whether you act with compassion or you forgive, and you forgive. I'd like to invite you all now to just close your eyes for a moment. I'd like you to find a place in your life where you have a wound or hurt, and that wound or hurt is still not healed. What would it feel like if somebody offered you, whoever that person is that made that transgression, what would it feel like if they offered a heroic apology? What would they have to say? And what would you feel? Chances are you would feel respected, cared for, 
validated, and soothed. But it's not easy. It's not easy because there's so many things that hold us back from giving a heroic apology. We may be too angry. We may not know we hurt someone. We may be living in our ego. We don't feel we have anything to apologize for, or we feel we're going to lower our status by apologizing. So I've always been fascinated by apologies, mostly because I've sucked at them. Not when it comes to my children. With my children, I'm offering heroic apologies, and they're flowing like a river. And with my friends, pretty much the same thing. With my husband, it's a whole different story. <laughs> so I've distilled it down to three things that we need to be able to do in order to offer a heroic apology. And I've brought it down to the three R's: our ability to regulate, relate, and restore. So regulate is how quickly you can calm your nervous system and self-soothe. Relate is a function of two things: our self-awareness and our perspective taking. And then restore is how do you go about feeling the hurt? How do you、uh, how do you go about healing the infraction? So about not so long ago, I went to visit my sister Annie, and she lives in a really swanky part of Manhattan. And I'm always so excited to go down to. NYC, and so I came, flew in on a Friday night, and then I remember getting up in the morning, and I'm I'm ready to go. I had it all planned out. We're going to go and have a really great brunch. Then we're going to go to Soho to Georgetown Cupcakes and get our favorite cupcakes from the 24-hour cupcake house. Then we're probably going to do some shopping and then go catch a show. It was all going to be perfect, except she didn't wake up. So mostly because I'm an early bird and she's a night owl. So I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to be patient. I'm going to sit down and just busy myself. So I did that for all of an hour, and I was quite proud of myself. And then I thought, okay, I think it's time for her to wake up. So I decided to go and just breathe really heavy, like, <sighs> but that wasn't working. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to do like what I do with my husband. I'm going to sit on the side of the bed and just going to move around a lot, and maybe eventually she's going to wake up. But she didn't wake up either, and now I started to feel started to feel frustrated, and I could feel a bit of resentment. And then finally, I'd say about around 10:30, I looked over her and I go, "Are you waking up yet?" And she's like, "What? What?" So she wakes up, and she's taking her time, of course, to get ready. Meanwhile, I'm all dressed, shoes on, ready to go. And then. I had worked myself up into such a frenzy that I didn't know how to calm down. All I could think about is, she's lazy and she's selfish, and only lazy people sleep in. And then she could see myself in this just entanglement of stress, and she goes, "Ria, what's wrong?" And I said, "Well, I thought we were going to get up and like start the day." And she goes, "Well, we, we've got we've got the whole day." And I said, it, "It's it's like 11:30. It's like half gone." So we were able to go back and heal that moment, but this brings me to my first R, which is regulation. What could I have done? What could I have said to myself in that moment, such that I would, I could have showed up with my sister in a way that I was proud of, so I didn't have to get, have it get to that place in the short, beautiful time that we had together. I really believe that regulation, or the ability to self-soothe, and when I say regulation, regulate our nervous system. Is probably the most important skill set that we can ever master in our lives,、uh, but we often struggle with it because most of us never grew up with parents that modeled it for us. We grew up with parents who loved us, lungs and liver, but didn't know how to feel their own feelings. And so, one thing that has been extremely helpful for me in understanding how to regulate. Was just my understanding of the human brain. So I'm not a neuroscientist, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Many of you may have heard of the triune model of the brain. And、uh, so the triune model of the brain basically says that the brain is made up of essentially three main parts. We've got the earliest brain, which is the amygdala, which sits right over the brain stem, and that one is the pre-verbal, pre-conscious, fight or flight part. It's where all of our senses at every moment. Before we get to the higher thinking part, comes into the amygdala, and basically it's like the hub. So it is designed to judge. 
You know, we grew up saying, hey, it's not good to judge, but the truth is we're all judgers. That's how we were, that's how we were designed. Because if a tiger's chasing us, we don't have time to think about, should I run? You gotta run. So the amygdala there has this amazing superpower, and the superpower is this. It has the ability, when you have a big emotion, like anger or sadness or fear, to hijack your entire brain. So of course, in the triune model of the brain, we also evolved the second part, the mammalian brain. This is the part of the brain that, as social constructs established, as relationships established, it's the emotional part of the brain that started to develop as we moved from fight or flight. And then we evolved the cortex, and really the most important part now, which makes us human, which is this piece right here behind our forehead, the prefrontal cortex, which allows us to have feelings about our feelings, which allows us to philosophize. So what we're really looking to do always is how do we go from our amygdala, which has the ability to hijack our brain and is there when we're having all of our big feelings, and then integrate it so that we can make good decisions and actually start using this part, right? So we want to be able to integrate our brain. We also know that we have a left and a right brain. Nobody's ever, like sometimes I hear people say, I'm either left brain or right brain, but no one is either left or right brain. Both inform each other. However, we know that the right brain thinks of the world in terms of we. It sees the big picture. It is the, leads with emotion. It, uh, it leads with connection. The left brain is linear. It loves lists, it's analytical, it's methodical. It sees the world in terms of I. So again, we always want to try and integrate the right and the left brain, but I'm going to give you a really good hack right now. And this is actually one of my favorite hacks, and that is whenever you see somebody that's upset, you always want to lead with the right brain. Uh, we have given the left brain a lot of importance, going from school, just from reading left to right. So we put a predominance on our left brain in order to answer somebody when they're angry or to respond to somebody when they're sad. And so what I'd invite you to do is whenever you see somebody having a big emotion, whether it's fear or sadness or anger or frustration, never lead with your left. Always lead with the right, redirect with the left. Lead with the right, redirect with, lead with connection, lead with tone, lead with softness, lead with um, touch. And only when the teachable moment comes, bring in a left brain response. So, let's go back to my sister. What could I have done in order to um, optimize that experience that I had with her for those two days? So, the first thing that I could have done is, well, first of all, we could have actually, the night before, set up a plan so that we both were in alignment about how the weekend was gonna go, and then we would have woken up and both of us, expectations would have been met, and that would have been great. I also could have done solo New York, because I'm really good solo, and who can't have fun in New York on their own? I could have done that. So the first thing that I could have done, though, that actually would have helped me regulate my nervous system would have been to breathe. Yeah? Your breath is your dial-in for your state. So I could have noticed. Now, here's the thing. Most people don't realize that they're angry or they're worked up until they're literally stomping around. Or they're really, really, like they're really, really sad, or they start to go into shutdown. I want to share with you some te techniques on how you can actually catch what's happening upstream long before you are in the vortex of anger or sadness or frustration. So your breath is the dial-in for your state. Meaning, if I'm always, if I'm confused about where I'm at, the first thing I need to check is go into my body and be able to see where is my breath at and am I breathing in a way that feels expansive? That takes the bearing out of the mouth. Am I breathing in such a way that's expansive or am I breathing in such a way that shows that I'm under a state of stress? And then I can start cluing in. Because one of the techniques that not only do I teach, but has been the biggest savior for my life when I start spinning is this. I imagine that I am in a scanner, a circular scanner. And as I'm going through the scanner, this scanner is simply scanning for sensations, okay? So it's scanning down, and I'm feeling into my forehead, I'm feeling to the back of my neck, my shoulders, eventually my chest. And the benefit of doing that is 
That is what it means to feel your feelings. I mean, people say the words feel your feelings all the time, but what does that mean? It means to actually feel the sensations, get out of your head and into your body. Find out where that sensation is. Is it in your chest? Is it in your throat? Is it in your head? And then when you find it, don't just abandon it. Don't just go, okay, I'm going to go put a load of laundry in or I'm going to go wash a dish or send a text. I'm going to actually stay with it. And it may feel uncomfortable. It may feel stressful because chances are when we were really young and we had those big feelings like jealousy at two and at five and at 10, no one was around to help us navigate that intricate labyrinth. So what we want to do is be able to stay with the feeling. And if we're willing to be courageous enough to stay with that feeling to completion, then you'll be able to get to the end of that tether. And at the end of that tether is always a jewel, an epiphany, a gem. This is where the unconscious wants to reveal itself. So if ever you want to get access to your unconscious, be courageous enough to actually stick with the feeling in your body. Because if you go color, texture, shape, movement, intensity, color, shape, texture, movement, intensity, it gets you out of your head and actually feeling your feelings because feelings are psychosomatic. Yeah, I can't crack open your head and go, aha, there's anger. But what I can do is I can find the physiology of anger. I could look on a, some sort of medical system. Where has the blood flowed? I could check my cortisol levels in my body to see that they're high or my adrenaline levels. I could feel the sensation in my chest or in my shoulders or in my back. And then I can actually stay with the feeling and actually feel my feelings. This is some of the most important work if, for those of you who are parents that you can teach your children how to do. In fact, we're teaching them right now in the kids program. And this is what it means to feel your feelings. And then what happens is if ever you're going to get whatever somatic intelligence that is at the end of that tether, then it's going to be there for you on tap. And then you can do something with it. So I could have noticed my breath. I could have hosted and interviewed my anger. I'm a good host. So why not, why not invite anger in? Why not invite my uncomfortability, my annoyance, my stress, my loneliness, invite them in. Imagine they're like a friend that's come from a far off place and say, hey, come sit down, lie down on the couch, eat from the buffet table. Let me ask you some questions about you. I'm so curious because I know that at the end of my anger and the end of my sadness has so much beauty that I get to tap into if I'm if I'm patient enough to stay with that feeling. So interview, interview your emotions. Name it to tame it. So this is something that I learned from Dan Siegel. Uh, he's a neuroscientist. And he says, the minute you have an emotion and you can find a word to describe what you're feeling, so the minute you're feeling overcome and the amygdala has hijacked your mind and you go, I'm actually feeling really angry at you right now, or I'm actually feeling really sad right now, is the minute you go from that amygdala response to your higher thinking brain. So you can name it to tame it. I can tell you that, uh, you know, often with my husband, who I love to bits, but I'll hold his hands and we'll be, there'll be something that's frustrating me and I'll say, I'm really angry right now. And I'll be crushing his hand and I go, but I love you more than I'm angry. And I can feel myself start to settle. Anything that allows you to have any sort of behavioral flexibility, like music. I remember every time I go out on a road trip with my husband and my kids, we always start the road trip holding hands. And I love that. Except I was mad before I got into the car, so I couldn't find a way to find my breath. Have you ever found that? Like you know it's important to breathe but you can't breathe because you're so angry. Has anyone been in that situation? Yeah? And so at that moment, I said, okay, I'm too angry to hold his hand, so I'm just gonna turn on the radio. We hadn't even pulled off yet. And as I pulled on the radio, thank goodness, one of my favorite songs came on. Then all of a sudden, I could get out of the story that I'm running in my head, and I could get into my body. Then I started to groove. And then within about a minute, I could grab and reach out to his hand. Okay, so anything that allows you to get into your body. Uh, John Medina wrote an amazing book called Brain Rules, and he says, if you're not moving, then you're depressed. If you're not moving, you're depressed. So as Dan Siegel says, move it to lose it. If you're feeling angry, move your body. I've tested this out, actually. I have been really frustrated, and I felt like I've had enough, and my husband says, hey, let's go to the schoolyard and take the kids for a walk. 
And I said, no, I don't want to go. You guys go. And then I thought, you know what? I'm going to do my own empirical research. I am going to start walking while I'm angry. So I started walking, and I walked about 100 meters, and I thought, nope, still angry. It's not working. And then I walked about another 100 meters, and I go, I still feel angry, but it's like about an 8 out of 10. Walked another 100 meters, and then I saw, okay, it's about 5 out of 10. And then by the time I got to the schoolyard and was throwing a basketball, I was like down to a zero. So move it to lose it. So those are just some really great hacks that I've used in my life in order to be able to calm my nervous system, soothe my amygdala, and start making a good decision. So the next R stands for relate. And relate is about self-awareness and perspective taking. So we're going to start with self-awareness. So self-awareness is really about what do I feel and why do I feel it? So let's go back to my sister. What was I feeling? Well, I was feeling like I wasn't important enough. If I was important enough, she would have got up early. I mean, I was only there for two days. So surely she would have made an effort. And the story that I was running is, you don't love me, because if you loved me enough, you would have woken up on time. So I want to share with you some hacks in order to build your self-awareness if ever you're feeling stuck. Because had I have self-regulated and calmed myself down, I might have been able to tap into what was actually going on, which is the fact that behind the anger was something else. And one thing that's helped me a lot is the recognition that there are three entities in a relationship. There's the I, there's the you, and in my case, there's the Annie Rhea, my sister, the Annie Rhea relationship or the we, the I, the you, and the we. And the more that we can couch our relationships in terms of seeing us as a we entity, the more powerful our relationships become. Because then, when you have uh, an issue or a disagreement, it doesn't become I against you. It becomes you and I, the we entity, are linked arm in arm. We're together, and we're fighting something completely separate. It's that, that over there, the misunderstanding. So we're always connected and we're trying to fight something that's separate from us. And then you feel the, a sense of, um, a sense of t togetherness and a sense of solidarity in the way that you approach, um, the way you approach your, your relationships. The other thing that I think is extremely helpful in, in becoming more self-aware is the recognition that anger is the bodyguard for sadness or fear. Yeah, it's the bodyguard. Behind anger is always either sadness or fear. That's a game changer. If you don't already know that, just, it really is a game changer. That means that every single time your child is angry at you, every single time your spouse or your partner or friend is angry at you, the next question you ask is, once you're calm and not defensive, is what are they sad and fearful about that is showing up as anger? Or maybe you're angry, and the minute you've calmed down and soothed your amygdala, the question you ask yourself is, what am I actually sad or fearful about that's showing up as anger? That is an absolute game change in your life because all of a sudden, it completely changes how you relate to others. My absolute favorite hack that's predicated on the foundation that I was able to self-soothe, like soothe my nervous system, is the wonderful ability to find my little girl, yeah? Or in, for the men out there, your little boy. So I mentioned before that if you're willing to be courageous and stay with the feeling, while everything in the world is going to try to distract you from feeling your feelings, by the way, and you stay with it for all the genius and intelligence it has to offer, at some point during that somatic experiencing where I'm actually present with the feeling, sensation, color, texture, movement. There's a moment where, and of course I'm breathing in order to like calm my nervous system, there's a moment where I get an image of my little girl. It's a little Rhea. Maybe she's five, maybe she's eight, maybe she's 10. And I get an image of what she looks like, and I just stand and I'm observing her third person. And then at some point, I reach out to her, and I say to her, these, this, this exact sentence. What is it that you want right now? What is it that you need right now? 
So I have a relationship with my little girl and I ask that question, what is it that you want right now? What is it that you need right now? Whatever that little girl says, that little Rhea says, whatever she says, I hold with the utmost reverence. I hold reverential listening because if ever my unconscious is going to reveal itself, it's now coming through her mouth. And she wants to impart something really deep that I might have buried long ago. So I want to get very clear on what she has to tell me. And whatever it is that she tells me, then I do it. That is the act of reparenting myself. Whatever places that my glorious parents might have missed the mark, this is my opportunity now to go and reparent myself. But I'll never get a window into that unless I go and ask my little girl what she needs right now. Or my little, you know, for some of you, my little boy. It's a really, really powerful exercise to do that. And it's something that I do every single time I get triggered. I mean, every time. Self-awareness is also the recognition of when my ego is running the show. How do I know when my ego is running the show? Well, usually when I'm in a power struggle. We get into power struggle with our partners, we get in power struggles with our kids. I can't really say I get in power struggles with my kids because I've learned a really tech good technique on how not to get into power struggles with my kids. I just go, you're right. It's easy. You never get in a power struggle if you go, you're right. I learned that one from my dad. And it works beautifully. They say it's red, you're right even though it's blue. Because I'm not out to win in that moment. See, the only way you ever get into a power struggle is if two people want to win. I'm not out to win. I'm prepared to footnote that and wait for the teachable moment, that moment when it's perfectly primed, when their mind is perfectly hospitable to whatever I have to say, whatever I have to impart. But it's usually 99.9% .9 of the time, not then. So, you're right, it served me very well. However, one of the things when I'm out of my ego that I ask, and this is something that I absolutely love, and I'm really happy to share this hack with you, is the minute I am out of my anger, the next question I ask is, what is it about me that created that? What is it about me that created that? It takes the onus completely off the other person because it's all a you, 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 shoulda, woulda, coulda, and puts it right back onto me. And then I remember how powerful I am. I remember that I get to choose how I feel. I get to remember that I get to step out into the world however I want to. So I ask, what is it about me that created that? And then I start to remember my power. But all of this is on the foundation that we can regulate our nervous system. You can't access our self-awareness, we can't access our little girl, we can't get out of the ego and power struggle if we're still triggered and still running the story. So we gotta get out of the story. Just like when you go to the gym. You don't go to the gym on the first day and go, oh, I'm gonna raise 150 pounds. No, on the first day you go and you go, oh, I'm gonna start with 10 and 15 and I'm gonna build the muscle. And then you have the opportunity to take everything from the dark and bring it to the light. You still with me? Okay. So the next part of, the next R, so it's still part of the, so we have regulation, and then we have the next R is relate, which we just talked about self-awareness. And I wanna share with you about perspective taking. Now a lot of people uh, combine perspective taking with empathy. So I just wanna make some distinctions. First distinction, sympathy is simply an expression. It's like, ah, oh, your dog died? Mm. Empathy is where you actually feel emotionally the pain of somebody else. That's empathy. It is a emotional, um, it's, it, it's, it's an emotional experience. Perspective taking is a cognitive experience. It is where you are, it's an act of imagination. If I were to look at an MRI when someone's taking perspectives versus somebody that is exhibiting empathy, different parts of the brain light up. So I'm gonna give you an example, a really easy example. Imagine you're driving along and a car just like kind of cuts you off while you've got your kids in the back. And the first reaction might be, what? What a jerk. He should have his license taken away, maybe. I'd probably think that. And then, as I begin to sit with it and start to take perspectives, I go, why did he cut me off? Why is he driving like a maniac? Okay, 
well, maybe he just lost his job and he's just having a really crap day. So I can feel myself start to settle myself a little bit. And then I go a bit deeper. I want to keep on going. Basically, it's a brainstorming mission, right? A brainstorming mission to see how many reasons can I come up with as to why this guy's cutting me off. Well, what's one that would have me really have my heart explode for this guy? His house is on fire. His wife just called him. He's got five minutes to get to his host the hospital because his daughter's there. Now, am I ever going to actually know which one's true? No. I don't even know this guy. He's just like, just cut me off and he's gone. I'll never actually know. But here's the trick. Here's the hack. In that moment when you don't know, choose the perspective that allows you to see the world as safe and beautiful and abundant. Choose that perspective. Without knowing, choose something that allows you to see the world as beautiful. And that's a game changer. So, one of the other hacks that I have for perspective taking is the recognition that every single thing that we do in some form or fashion, it's just a belief that I have, is code for how much do you love me. Husband doesn't bring home the milk in time, I'm feeling frustrated, somewhere in there is how much do you love me. Friend doesn't call me, I thought she would have called me because you know, I just came back from my fabulous trip in Estonia, how much do you love me? If you start seeing that, um, holding that belief, everything's code for how much do you love me, then you start feeling a sense of real empathy and softness for everybody else. One of the things that has been also helpful and has been a very useful hack with perspective taking is the minute I find, because I judge, remember, we all judge, so the minute I find myself judging and I go, oh, I wouldn't do that, I'd never say that, I'd never act like that, I don't believe in that, I find a place in my life where I know that if, like, you know, I'm into personal development, so I know that if I just did this, my life would be amplified, 10 times better. I know that I'd be functioning on all cylinders if I just did this act, made this little tiny change in my life, I'd have it nailed. But you know what? I've known it for years, still haven't nailed it. And I know that it'll actually make an incremental difference, a meaningful difference in my life, and yet I still haven't done it. So when I see, and I'm feeling very judgy, 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 I start thinking about all those little things that I know about that would actually improve my life and how hard it is for me to make that change. And then all of a sudden what happens is, is I get a different perspective of it and I start to feel a sense of softness. I feel a sense of softness for where you're at and where you are in your journey. Because I know on my journey, I haven't nailed it. And I'm still in the process. And I'm still struggling with things that are like super simple and would make my life so easy. So that's something that I do on a regular basis in order to feel a sense of empathy and softness and take a different perspective for people. So let's go back to my sister in Gotham. Suppose I had calmed myself down. Suppose I had gone to my breath, I'd recognize I'm angry, I'd said to her that I'm, you know, I was just feeling really sad because remember beside, behind anger is always either sadness or fear. Then I would have been able to be calm and I would have showed up in a way that probably wouldn't have to involve any apology whatsoever. However, that's not the way it happened. So we actually had to go to the third R, which is how do you restore? And restore is the actually the actual apology, which is where you want to feel respected, cared for, validated, and soothed. Okay, so what does a heroic apology look like? Well, first of all, let me just tell you, the words I'm sorry is not an apology. The words I'm sorry is simply an expression, okay? So how are you, how are you meant to have somebody feel respected, cared for, validated, and soothed? Well, it first starts with the recognition that, and here's one of my favorite hacks for restoring, is the recognition that everybody wants to feel right and good. So as you go about through your amazing experience in talent and meeting all these new people, if you just kind of hold that somewhere in the back of your mind, everyone I meet, no matter what they say and what they do, they want to feel right and good about whatever it is they're saying, 
then how you respond, what you validate, what you, what you say in response to that changes dramatically. So everyone wants to feel right and good. The second one is everybody, when they're hearing an apology, or at any point in time when they say something, they want to feel validated and affirmed, which is basically the, you're right. They want to feel that what they're saying is, has merit, is justified, is reasonable, is right. So my, one of my hacks, I'm giving you all kinds of hacks here today, but one of my favorite hacks is when you want to restore something with somebody, okay? This is like, this is the, 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 the move I pull when I want to show up like a hero, okay? I imagine that as I'm in the, the depths of my pain and my anger and my sadness and whatever, as soon as I've regulated enough to have some bit of consciousness and clarity, I imagine my life is right now, whatever's happening, all the characters that are all around me are up on a movie screen, including me. And then I say to myself, as I watch that movie screen, what would that girl that's playing Rhea have to do where I would go, where did she pull that from? Where did she pull from her baby toe to respond like that in a way that I would be clapping triumphantly for her? And it takes that little bit of distance that allows me to get that image in my mind has me think about how can I now show up in a way that's magnificent, heroic? What would she have to say and do that everybody in the audience would be clapping for? I don't know where she got that from. Let, that's amazing. That's something that I do on a, on, on a regular basis whenever I'm at that crossroads between how should I respond or even if I'm not getting anything back. Because at the end of the day, I can only control myself and I want to show up. That's that's the game I'm playing. I want to show up like a hero as much as possible. Now, when we're talking about the actual apology and restoring the apology, of course, we have to also think about how you do it. Um, how you do it. So, I don't know about you guys, but have any of you guys ever got an apology and it sounds like an F you? Yeah. yeah? Okay, so this is where all the all the, the soft skills come in. Your tone, your touch, your eye contact, everything that allows that person to feel really deeply heart connected to you so that the apology lands. <coughs> and of course, the other little thing is to keep it short. I know that from doing many, uh, many apologies that have gone completely wonky. So that's why I wanna tell you a little bit about non-apologies. So this is where you think it's apology, but you've actually screwed it right up, okay? So I'm gonna give you a few, and I'm gonna see if you guys can figure out what went drastically wrong with this apology, okay? So I'm sorry I'm late, but I got hung up in traffic. I'm sorry I yelled, but I told you five times. I'm sorry I have a tone, but you didn't listen the first few times. The but. The but. That's right, because it cancels the original message and as if there's a justification or an excuse. Have you guys ever got caught out using an apology like that one? Anyone? Okay, so let's try another one. I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings. I'm sorry if I had a tone. In fact, I got caught out on this just the other day. I went and I saw my little daughter and she was in a room and I said, oh, I'm sorry if I had a tone. I'm sorry if I was insensitive. What's wrong with that apology? If, why? Because they're not validating at all. Saying like, if I was insensitive, I don't think I was. Yeah. yeah. You totally wiggle out of responsibility, right? Okay. All right, let's try another. I'm sorry you felt that way. I'm sorry you felt I was rude. I'm sorry you got so upset. What's wrong with that apology? Yeah, it's almost like the issue was with you. Not everybody would get, up, get upset at that, but you would, because you're a weirdo. Yeah. <laughs> How about this one? I know I've used this, but I can't think of when, but tell me if this resonates at all. I really want to apologize for what happened yesterday. <laughs> I really want to, I want to. That's not an apology. That is an expression of intent. So do the work, okay, do the work. The next bit of apologies that go wrong is where somebody over-apologizes. Over -apologizes. Have you guys experienced that? 
Are you an over-apologizer? Yes. yes? Okay, so over-apologizing sometimes can be an esteem thing, sometimes it can be a Canadian thing. <laughs> right? But the problem with over-apologizing is that it puts an immense amount of pressure on the person who's receiving the apology to try now, and when they could have just been doing something else, now they have to appease you and comfort you. It puts a lot of extra anxiety and stress on that person, so we want to relieve them of that, right? We want to keep it short. Forcing an apology. So some of you are parents that are out here in the audience, and I'm a parent myself, and I just wanted to share why I believe that we should never force an apology. I've never, ever, ever asked my children to apologize to somebody for doing something. And the reason why, and they might have done something that might have been insensitive, but the reason why is when I force somebody to apologize, I don't trust, it's an untrustable apology. I don't believe that it's come from an intrinsic part of them, where they've sat down and they've waited out and they've come to the conclusion themselves on how do I heal this. So, if you're a parent, uh, I invite you to ask a really great question. Ask some beautiful questions that allow the child to go deep and to introspect and to reflect, and then see what they come up with themselves. Don't be attached to whether they apologize or not. Forgo the need to look good in front of the other parent in that moment. Footnote it and find the teachable moment, that exquisite moment where you're all yummy, yummy right before bed maybe, and then see what happens in that space. And lastly, just because I'm talking about parenting in this moment, and that has to do with, for those of you who are parents, and as a conscious parenting coach, uh, I believe that it's always the parent's job to lead, to always to lead to the apology. There are places in our lives where we have no clue because we're rushing around like mad people, and we have no clue that we've hurt somebody in the household. And it could be the, most, the smallest infraction. And uh, so, on that note, it's wonderful to continuously ask for feedback from your children. I mean, it's probably one of the best things in the world, the best gift, actually, in the world is for someone to ask, is there anything I can do to be a better friend? Is there anything I can do to love you better? Is there anything I can do to be a better mother? If you ask that question often, people will be, love you. I really am working at being a better friend. I want to make it a safe space for you to tell me anything so I can show up like a hero. What can I do? So, being able to lead the apology as a parent uh, is so important because our children, our children grow up and they just get longer legs, longer limbs, and bigger heads. But they are always hungry. It never changes. That parenting dynamic never changes. That child is always yearning for the parent to reach out and lose their ego and be vulnerable and lead the apology. So we cannot talk about apologies, of course, without talking about forgiveness. And one of my favorite quotes of all time is by Gandhi, and he says, the more a man knows, the more he forgives. The reason why I find that so beautiful is because if we knew every hurt, every experience, every missed opportunity, every paper cut that exists on someone's heart, then we could forgive everything. We can understand their entire being in that moment. Couldn't we? But we don't. We don't have a window or privy, so we have to use our imagination. We have to do some perspective taking to try and imagine what created that response, what created that action. But the more a man knows, the more he forgives, then I can create some forgiveness and softness in my heart instead of feeling you, 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 or judge, judge, judge. We live in a world where it's so run by ego, and we want to win. We want to win at every opportunity. We want vindication. That's why it's so hard for us sometimes to forgive. And so uh, there, was a, uh, there was an article that I read, and it was by Dr. Kelly Flanagan, and it was so beautiful, and I've read this article so many times. It's longer than what I'm about to read now, but I will tell you that I've adapted it. Um, significantly to work for today, but the, the major sentiments that he offered are here, including a few of my own. So I'm just going to take a moment and read it to you because it's one of my favorite articles of all time. Many think forgiving is at odds with being right and winning, but perhaps real relationships are made for losers. When it comes to winning and losing, I think there are three kinds of relationships. In the first, both people are competing to win 
and it's a duel to the death, armed with a vast arsenal ranging from fists to words to silence. These are the connections that destroy. The second kind of relationship is ripe with winning and losing, but the roles are set, and the loser is always the same person. These are the truly abusive relationships, the ones in which one dominates and the other submits. And in the process, both are stripped of their dignity. These are the relationships of addicts and enablers, tyrants and slaves, and they may be the saddest of all. But there's a third kind of relationship. And it's not perfect, not even close. But it's a decision that has been made between two people to love each other to the limit and sacrifice the most important thing of all. I feel sad right now because I really think this is beautiful. To sacrifice the most important thing of all, their selves. In these relations, losing becomes a way of life, a competition to who can listen to, care for, serve, forgive, and accept the other the most. It's a competition to see who can heal the other the most, who can increase the dignity and strength of the other. These relationships create characters who can be humble and merciful, loving and peaceful, and they are revolutionary in the purest sense of the word. Revolutionary because forgiveness can be seen as an act that elevates both parties to a higher dignity. When you can forgive quickly and voluntarily, you are unburdened by the tyranny of needing to be right. This is something that I had to do much of in my life. And you can just be. You can become very powerful you are not stunted by grudges or bitterness. Your energy is no longer tied up in loops of resent. You're free. Then you can love with the fierce grace of an ocean that refused no river. So I've shared with you some ideas on how to offer a heroic apology. We've spoken about the three R's, or I've shared about the three R's, how to regulate, how to relate, and how to restore. And I encourage you all to continue practicing how to give an epic apology. But I want to leave you with one last thought. Okay, this is when everything goes wrong and you're on stage, yeah. Uh, I want to leave you with a couple of last thoughts, and one is there's no statute of limitations to offering an apology. If there is something that's happened in your life, I'll tell you, something happened 10 years ago with my husband, I don't know, it was something silly. And we were, we were at the Grand Canyon, and literally, it was only about two weeks ago, I said, oh, you know, he was right. And I was, I was wrong. And so I found him and I said to him, I was, I was wrong, and I'm sorry, you were actually right, and I, and I gave, told them exactly how and the impact it had. And so there is no statute of limitations on apologies, and I share that with you because right now, maybe you're thinking about apologies, maybe you're thinking about who you can apologize to, or where you can clean up some of the mess that's out there. And if, if you have the opportunity, then after the session, go ahead and do it. The final offering that I want to leave you with, though, is that I believe that our default nature is caring is love, is light. And our time here on Earth is meant to be, or is meant to offer the most loving expression of ourselves that we can possibly conjure up. And what I understand that to mean is how does Rhea become, how do all of you become the highest level of magnificence that you can summon in your life? And what helps me really keep that into in a world of wanting to be more, do more, acquire more, I recognize that I'm really, in the whole time-space continuum, I'm literally a speck of dust on a speck of dust floating through the cosmos. I'm here for like a blink of an eye, not even. What else is there to do than to have my heart blown wide open such that I can respond to people in a way that is heart-centered, respond to people in a way that is based on togetherness and a loving response. So now I'm about to upend everything I've just told you about apologies and forgiveness. That the only time we ever actually need to apologize or to forgive 
is when we've forgotten who we are at core, that at our actual core is a loving expression. That is who we are. And that's what we're always trying to find our way back to. And if we're able to do that, then we're able to, if we're able to do that, then we're able to offer an apology. The need for the apology starts to become minimized. So I'd like to end, you, end with this. Here is to heroic apologies, but here's to a world where we need them less and less.